All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the meeting. Uh, we're going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, first item on the agenda is to review and approve the minutes from the last committee meeting, uh, which I believe was January 25th. Everybody should have the, the minutes in front of them. Mr. Yes. Chair, I have a correction. Okay. On page two, the third paragraph, second sentence, extra requirements on page 11 had to be met by the city and indicated how the meeting is meeting the requirements. I believe that is how the city is meeting the requirements. Okay, I heard a rumor that would be needed to be changed. So any other corrections to the minutes? Well, I said entertain a motion to uh, approve the minutes as revised. Move to approve, Jamison. Second, Rolfing. All right, I have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Uh, next on the agenda, we have uh, Mr. Dean Bucknerberg with Ide Bailey is with us today, so I'll turn it over to you, Dean. Well, good afternoon. I'm Dean Bucknerberg, a partner with uh, Ide Bailey here in town. Rich, could you help me or could somebody help me with uh, uh, yeah. contacting? My fellow partner, Dave Steen in Minneapolis, okay. going to get... Do we want to do it on this phone? Too? Yes. Okay. Let's do it on this phone. Dave Steen of our Minneapolis office is, is the engagement partner. I'm the local... Uh, uh, I'd Bailey partner contact on, on the Dave. engagement. Hi, Dave. The, this is Tamara with the audit committee meeting. We're just setting you up for the microphone. So you can hear Hi, good me. afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon to you, too. Good afternoon, Dave. Um, and uh, so today's meeting, um, we're going to call on, on Dave and his expertise, but uh, to sort of set the framework, you know, we have been engaged to do uh, the audit of the city of Sioux Falls. And, including the single audit of the federal financial awards that the city receives, um, some $22 million, I believe, for this last year, uh, over 40 programs. And uh, we've, we've, done, we've done the audit. We're not quite uh, wrapped up yet. So this is, this is meant to be a, sort of a preliminary briefing on where, uh, where we're at with that and, and the results of, of the engagement so far and what we found. So, Dave, uh, I, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to you to, to go through that. Dave? Okay, thanks, Dean. Okay. Yeah, I'll just have some comments about the audit and certainly happy to take any questions as we go. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, the audit went very well, very much uh, as planned. We found the records accounting information in very, very good condition. Uh, excellent cooperation by the city staff. Everything went really well. No difficulties or disagreements. And again, uh, we started the audit process. We did some pre-audit back in November and December. We also have some year-end procedures on inventory and on cutoff. But most of the field work started about the end of January, the first few weeks of February, which again is a very fast close for a large area like yours for Sioux Falls. I think that speaks very, very highly of the processes that you have in place to keep things moving throughout the year to be able to close and have an audit team ready to come in at that time. Uh, we had no proposed audit adjustments. Uh, there were no uncorrected adjustments or corrected adjustments required during the audit. That also indicates, I think, you're receiving good information throughout the year. Um, and also good cooperation, I think, with city departments so that you've got good processes to get all the information up to the finance department on a timely basis. Uh, we will be issuing an unqualified or a clean opinion on the financial statements. Uh, we do not expect to have any deficiencies, material weaknesses. We're finding their question cost in the internal the reporting on internal control or on compliance over the financial statements or on the federal major programs. Uh, there's a process with the CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, uh, that has been reviewed and approved by the South Dakota Department of Legislative Audit. It has been addressed. And then also the team and our audit team and the city staff have considered last year's 
review comments and suggestions by the Government Finance Officers Association. Uh, if you may recall, there's an annual award that the city has had for many, many years for excellence in financial reporting. And it seems to be routine, but it's a very comprehensive program to go through. It's reviewed by a number of reviewers around the country. I'm actually one of those reviewers. I can't review clients, of course, but it's a very comprehensive review. And the city does very, very well with that. They oftentimes have, might have a few suggestions, but those have been addressed based on last year's report. Not to mention the single audit, Dean, there's about $22 million in expenditures of awards last year, federal, and a large number of programs. Uh, we have to go through a process, a risk-based approach, and decide which one of those are classified as major, and that depends on risk potentially in the program. If it's a new program or not, not and the dollar amounts, we've selected a number of major programs, went through those, we tested internal controls on those programs and tested compliance with requirements. And again, we had no findings or question costs in relation to those. Uh, last year, no change in accounting policies last year. Uh, there are estimates and financial statements. Uh, those would include depreciation, of course, it's an obvious estimate, capitalization of infrastructure, uh, incurred but not reported health insurance claims, and landfill closure costs, post-closure costs. Um, Overall processes, we did not have any issues or weaknesses that we noted in terms of internal control based on the areas that we looked at. Uh, we certainly want to remind audit committees and council members that they have a responsibility to understand those controls at a high level and certainly ask good questions, which I think you do. So it's not an absolute process, but I think the processes that you have in place, good controls in place. Uh, the internal audit, we went through all the internal audit reports the last year and we looked at those and considered those during our audit process we went through so that's a quick tour on the process again uh, really no exceptions or no compliance issues no internal control issues that surfaced during that certainly glad to take any questions or uh, Dean or Dave do you know when the audit report will be available I, I think the goal is to issue that by the end of March next week sometime so it, be close. So we'll have a, a final final audit report and management letter available for your next meeting whenever whenever that might be. Okay. And so then the question is, do you want us to do a formal presentation at that time? I think that would be good, yeah. If you could spare five, ten minutes. So our next scheduled meeting would be, I believe, May seventeenth, if my memory serves me right. And that's Tuesday. So any other questions for the Ide Bailey Yeah, I, I said one question for, for Dave. Um, the management's responsible for preparing the financial statements. If, if you had been preparing the financial statements, would there be anything that you would have presented differently? Uh, that's a great question. It, as a matter of fact, I think that's one Warren Buffett actually has when he's in front of audit committee, so it is a great question. I, I know there was really nothing unusual, nothing sensitive. Uh, you know, we go through, we're not expressing an opinion on the letter of transmittal on the MDNA that's in relation to the financial statements, but we do look to see if there's anything kind of stirring the reader one way or another. Uh, we did not see anything unusual, and if we had written it ourselves, I'm not sure it would have been at all different in those areas. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure always to work with the city of Sioux Falls. We did have uh, great cooperation all the way around. Went went very well. Thanks. Good uh, before we move on to the next item on our agenda, I forgot to remind people, uh, if you haven't signed in, I believe Tamara's sign-in table is right over there. Uh, we do need everybody to sign in. So uh, before you leave today, if you haven't signed in, please do so so we can get a record of everybody who's here. So. Okay, next item on the agenda, uh, review report, uh, follow up on the status of auto recommendations. Rich, are you going to roll with that? Yeah, um, you should have the hard copy in, uh, in front of you there. Um, just for the, for the purpose of brevity, um, we just kind of briefly state what the, what the recommendation was and then kind of what were the statuses of that recommendation. 
most of the recommendations were from 2009. Um, and um, the, you know, the one exception was the, the report that we did on code enforcement. That was from 2008. And um, that is on page, uh, page 8, 8 through 10. Uh, the City Council got a briefing, I think, a couple weeks ago from uh, Kevin Smith on code enforcement. Uh, that's, this is just kind of a, uh, some of the same territory. Uh, the response was a little bit uh, longer just because it's, it's been a high, kind of a high-profile uh, area. Um, and um, while uh, the response may have not uh, followed the audit recommendation precisely, we believe that um, it, it's making positive change, and that, that's part of our city, our audit charter is to be a catalyst for positive change. So we're sort of pleased about some of the changes that are happening in code enforcement. And um, um, on page uh, three of your report at the top there, um, we, we saw that management has made considerable progress in addressing uh, many of the issues. Obviously, we don't have always 100% agreement on recommendations. We don't, in the realistic, uh, it's not realistic to expect to have 100% uh, concurrence, but um, management was making considerable progress on a lot of the uh, audit recommendations, so we wanted to point that out. And uh, so if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Any questions or concerns for Rich on this one? All right, hearing none, I'd entertain a motion then to approve this report. Move to approve, Jamison. Second, Oppegard. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. All right, next one on the agenda, Railroad Relocation Fund. <clears throat> yes, um, I did that report, and, and it's basically an informational report. Uh, we kind of looked at what the annual audit plan, uh, what we put in there for this, for this uh, project. And the purpose was just to describe the purpose and the history of the fund. And the, the, the purpose of the fund was to account for the railroad relocation project in downtown Sioux Falls. And then so we had a brief history and, and what's gone into that fund that was established in 2006. And then we reported on the activity to date, uh, looking at the revenues and expenditures. And on uh, page three there, there's a, there's a table of the expenditures. Uh, most of the activity um, deals with payments for the um, consulting agreement uh, to do the environmental assessment. And that, that was required before any design work or any construction happens. And then the other uh, thing that we looked at was um, we became, became aware that there had been some sort of uh, audit report on this fund um, in the past few years. So we kind of tracked that down. And the, uh, the state DOT is the administrating agency for these funds. The funds originally are appropriated by Congress, uh, and then the funds are awarded by the Federal Highway Administration, and the South Dakota DOT is kind of the local arm of the Federal Highway Administration. So they oversee the, the funds, they, they kind of oversee the project, and then we as the local agency are the users of the fund. So their audit office in the state DOT had done a, done a, um, a financial review of the um, of expenditures and uh, so what happened in, um, uh, that, that had happened in about uh, late 2008, activity stopped on the project. And um, for about two years there, we've been dealing with uh, doing the audit and responding to the audit. And uh, I just briefly summarized some of the audit findings on page four there. Uh, the language there is directly from the, uh, the state audit office at the DOT. And then I checked with management um, to find out what the status was of, of the corrective action that, they, that had been agreed to, and that was summarized at the bottom of page four there. Um, there's a comprehensive management plan that's in the works. Um, there was uh, an amendment to the agreement, amendment number five, that was completed on February 14th of this year between the city and the, uh, the consultant. And then uh, DOT had agreed to provide more training to the city and to other local agencies to uh, help uh, understand the requirements uh, better for these type of projects. So that's uh, pretty much where it sits. It's just more of an informational report. There was no recommendations, uh, so we didn't ask for or expect a reply from management. We did send it to management about a week ago and just said, please check it for factual accuracy. Um, you know, if there's something that's factually wrong, to let us know. So Did it go to Mark? Is that I sent it to Mark. I sent okay. it to, to the finance department, okay. too. And so. Mark, you're okay with what's there? Okay. Yeah. Any questions uh, on this report? Yeah, Deborah. I just had a couple questions, Rich. Um, and in part, uh, because there was a draft, I think, of the 
um, Department of Transportation's audit, or is it the Audit Office of SODOT? Yes. Um, and so in the redrafting of the contract you mentioned in February, there were some concerns in this audit uh, about complying with federal and and state law. Were those the adjustments then in that Yeah, February when contract? I looked at that amendment and they'd added those requirements that, that the contractor has to comply with, you know, various federal, uh, very specific requirements. So that language is added in uh, amendment number five. And that was, uh, I guess, a, a, um, that was completed on February 14th of this year. Okay. okay. And then one more if I could, Brad. Yep. Um, and there was um, concerns about, it seems like in this audit, again, it might have been observation six or five, uh, that, and that's in, again, this is the South Dakota audit, um, but it, it talks about um, approvals. Was that, was council supposed to approve of some of those expenditures before those were expensed? No, no, the, um, okay. no, no. Okay. That had to do with management approving the, um, the expenditures, and then they have to basically to, to receive the money from the, from the award, you have to spend the money, and then you, you okay. submit that package up to the DOT, and then you get reimbursed. So those were only expenses. federal funds then? Those weren't sales tax dollars? No. No, these, these were only um, federal. They, they put this in a, a special fund. Uh, it's called Fund 254, the Railroad Relocation. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was initiated in, in 2006, so that's where the activity has been been accounted for. Um, early in the history of that project, um, way back, you know, uh, I think in 2000, uh, oh, 2000 or 2001, they were using that second penny for for some work. But in 2006, when they got that uh, earmark of 40 million, they set up the, the special fund to account for all the activity in there. So great, great. That's all I had. Thank you. Any other questions for Rich on this one? Looks like the DOT was very thorough. They're very thorough, right. yes. So. All right, if there's no other questions for Rich, uh, even though there's no findings, we still need a motion to approve uh, this report. So if I could get a motion to approve it in a second. So moved, Aguilar. Second, Marsh. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. All right, next item, number six on the agenda, is the Great Plains Zoo and Dalbridge Museum report. Yeah. The, uh, Rich, uh, you going to run with that one? Yeah, I'll have to because uh, Jeff, um, who did the audit, he, is, okay. he had a medical procedure today, so he's out of action for about a week and a half or two. So. Okay. Uh, so anyway, we, um, we um, went over it yesterday, and uh, we did incorporate the management response. We'd received that on Friday, so we... Uh, Jeff had put that into the report. I put that in your hard copy there. So mm -hmm. where you see the results and where you see the recommendation, then you'll see the, the city response and, and uh, the zoo response. This is an agreement uh, between the city of Sioux Falls and the, uh, the um, Sioux Falls Zoological Society, which is a nonprofit corporation. The, the city owns the zoo. Um, we enter into an agreement with the Zoological Society to, ru to run the zoo on our behalf and then we provide financial support. And also the, the park department, which is the, the city's liaison, the park director is the liaison uh, between the city and the zoo. They would provide a routine maintenance for the grounds um, and that, that sort of work is, so the city is providing cash and we're also providing contributions in kind, okay? And then the, the Zoological Society will also be responsible for raising funds, uh, additional funds necessary for operations. And so uh, we just kind of looked at the at this agreement, and um, you know it's it's noteworthy that uh, on page five there um, that back in about six years ago conditions at the zoo had been deteriorating, um, and there was a to be frank there was a poor relationship between the, the city and the zoo management. Um, uh, in uh, I think late 2005, early 2006, uh, there was a new executive director, Elizabeth was appointed, and uh, she and her team have done a great job in those uh, six years or so. Um, uh, the, the zoo is in very good shape now, um, and uh, we just want to point that out, that they're, they're, they're doing a very good job there. So uh, we're very happy to see that. And uh, we'll look at page uh, six there, and we had a couple of results there and recommendations. Uh, we noted that the, um, on the agreement, um, there was a, uh, an amendment or a restated agreement that was signed on October 25th of last year. And we noted that the beginning date of that, that 
contract was in January of 2006. So our, our question was about the, the, the effective date. Um, um, uh, the language we used is questionable for the city to implement a new agreement with new terms and conditions retroactive back nearly five years. Um, the, the city has, has responded. You can see that on your hard copy there. Um, uh, they, they did not agree with our recommendation. Um, um, and uh, the, uh, we have uh, Karen Leonard from the city attorney's office if you have questions about that. But, uh, so, but anyway, I'll, I'll just keep going. And then maybe if you have questions yeah, at the end, you can again. ask me or ask uh, Don Kearney or, or Karen Leonard. So. Yeah. Um, result number two, that had to do with um, that was a change. Um, when we, uh, when we amended this agreement that uh, previously the city would retain uh, ownership of the, of the animals. Uh, the new agreement, uh, the way we read it, that it, it transferred the ownership of the live inventory animal to the society. Uh, we questioned whether that was, um, we had some issues with the legality of that under state law. We, we talked to uh, a person up in the legislative audit. Uh, you know, we asked him about, is there any state law that pertains when uh, we quoted that. Um, we did note that, that there's other large zoos in the country, um, such as the Dallas Zoo, the San Francisco Zoo, the Kansas Zoo, the San Diego Zoo, that, um, that have in common where the city, the municipality owns the zoo, the animals of the buildings, and the zoological society operates the, uh, the facility. Uh, so we didn't see that there was an advantage for the city to turn over ownership of the, of the animals to the uh, zoological society. Uh, management did, would say that um, when we talked to Don Kearney and his staff that, you know, um, you know, it's highly unlikely the zoo is going <laughs> to you know, get rid of the animals. That's not, not likely to happen. That, that, that's, their, that's their bread and butter. That's why people come to the zoo. Um, they also explained that it, it, the zoo need flexibility in order to uh, trade animals. Uh, and, uh, that, you know, the thought was it would be kind of awkward if they have to come to the city council and ask permission or give notice whenever they want to trade animals. Um, on the other hand, we pointed out that for years the city has operated the zoo under the old conditions where, where, the, where the city maintained ownership. Uh, and we pointed out that it wasn't that long ago when there was a, a frosty relationship between the, the management of the zoo and the city. Um, um, and, and so we just thought that was a risk that, it was, uh, that we didn't need to take as, as a city uh, to, to transfer ownership over. Um, so. That, that was our, our point on recommendation two, and, and you can see the management response. And, um, and uh, I, when I read the response, uh, perhaps when we do a new agreement, we can revisit that issue again and, and decide how we want to handle that between the, the society and the city. So uh, we'll move along to number three there. Uh, number three and number four uh, were basically transparency issues. Under the old agreement, uh, it was required to provide the city the IRS Form 990, which is an information return that every nonprofit corporation has to prepare. Uh, it's just, you know, just information return. They don't pay taxes, obviously. And number four was that uh, under the old agreement, they had to pr provide the city uh, and the park board an annual report. Um, under the restated agreement, that, that those requirements were taken out. They did not have to provide the 990, and they did not have to provide a uh, written annual report. Uh, the language instead was, as requested, the zoo will report to the park board. And uh, on, uh, as far as the 990, a uh, concern of the zoo was that they have donors that give money to the zoo. Um, they, they were concerned that if there were too many copies of the 990 out there that, that the privacy of the donor might be compromised. Um, um, so that, that, was, that was the response for management. That was one reason why the zoo would prefer not to give the 990 out. Um, so, but we felt as auditors that when we're giving money to a nonprofit, the more transparency, the better. So we thought that they should have to provide at least us the 990 and, and an annual report. So that's why we put that in the, as audit recommendations. So. And the, the finally on page, uh, the bottom page nine there, uh, there was a $75,000 loan that was um, initiated in 2000. At that time, the, the zoo was having some cash flow issues. They needed some cash from the city. So um, it was agreed that the city would give an interest-free loan to the zoo that was uh, 75000 It was payable in 2005. And so in December 22, 2000, we, uh, we sent a check to the, to the society. And that was due on October 1st, 2005. 
By agreement, uh, that due date was extended about another six months into 2006, March of 2006. And then uh, as, and we looked into this um, about six months later, September 18th, um, the city sent a check of $75,000 to the society. And about a week later, the city received $75,000 back from the society. Um, our concern there was that it seemed convoluted to do it that way. We thought, could we just do this with a journal entry? And then the bigger point was that the original loan had gone through the city council as a resolution. In other words, the city council said, yes, we agree to loan you $75,000. Um, when the decision was made uh, to, we, we saw it as a forgiveness of the loan. It, it never went through the city council. It just, it just sort of happened. Um, so we question that. Um, the response from, uh, from the finance was that, um, in their opinion, you had a better audit trail if, if they did it the way they did it. Um, they didn't address the issue of going through the council, though. So I guess that was our issue. And, and um, we thought that was, you know, if it was initiated by the council by resolution, if you're going to change the terms, that it should go through the council by resolution. So. Uh, we had a few opportunities for improvement on page 10 and 11, um, you know, not, not, not real big things. Um, you know, the, for example, the bylaws of the society uh, on, the, on the website uh, were outdated. They needed to be updated. Uh, we had um, insurance register that needed to, to be um, uh, a change there. Um, we did look at the cash. The, the final opportunity improvement had to do with the, the cash there. We were looking through the financial statements. It looked like their cash was, uh, in, they were in a weak position there. They had more liabilities than they had uh, assets as far as current liabilities and current assets. Uh, normally you want to see your assets greater than your liabilities. I, ideally you want about a two to one ratio or better. Um, in the end of 2009, their ratio of assets to liabilities was about a 0.57 to one. Um, so we just suggest that maybe they can move some of their, some of their other assets into cash. Um, they, they, they were, uh, society, the zoo society says, you know, they'll, they'll talk to Ide Bailey, their auditors, about that if, if they wanted, uh, if that would be a good idea. So um, we would like to express our appreciation uh, to, uh, to Elizabeth and her staff. They're extremely cooperative. They're doing a, a great job of running the zoo. Um, and no, no issues of cooperation there. Um, so if you have any questions for me or for Don or for, uh, for, for Karen from the city attorneys, we can. I have a question for you, Rich. Okay. I guess the biggest finding would be number, number two there. I uh, think the number tra two. Transfer the of transfer the, animals. The animals. Yeah. yeah. Is the city in compliance then with all the laws and regulations that they need to be under the current agreement? I would say not. Well, the way we see it is that, that um, when we're looking at state law mm -hmm. and, our, and our capital assets policy, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think we can just go ahead and, by agreement, just move the animals over to a, to a nonprofit. Um, you know, it gets kind of, a, it gets to be a legal question, um, interpretation. Yeah. So um, when, when we looked at that, we thought, I don't think we should have done that. I don't, but um, the city attorney is here to address that issue, too, if. if um, yeah, I'd like to yeah. hear about it if, if you have an opinion. If there's something we need to change, I guess I'd like to get it changed. Hi, I'm Karen Leonard. I'm an assistant city attorney. Um, what I did was I brought up the language from the old agreement because what we were trying to do was to understand that when we negotiated the amendment. And it, and it, it stated that regarding the live animals, whether now existing or hereafter acquired, shall be considered for all purposes as having been acquired by the society on behalf of, as the agent for, and for the sole and exclusive benefit of the city, with the society holding all such property as custodian in trust for and on behalf of the society. So even back under the old agreement, there was some wordsmithing done, in my opinion, on how do we comply with, with state law, and I think the legal department at that time tried to still give the society flexibility, and when we were negotiating the amendment, we also, always had the intent that we would always ultimately own those animals at the end of the day should the society cease to manage it. But we wanted to give the society some flexibility, so we talked about putting the language rather than for all purposes having them having acquired that, we talked about 
whether or not should we let them have the ownership there. So I still think that that's a, there's, there's, there was legal issues then and there may be legal issues now and it's something we should talk about when it gets renegotiated as it does expire at the end yeah. of the year, so it seems efficient Somebody to talk about it. Somebody will have to clarify legally, yeah, I think before the new contract comes up again, that yeah. right. who owns the animals. So. Karen, do you expect like this summer we would be revisiting the, the agreement since it expires at the end of the year then? That's typically okay. how our management contracts take several months to negotiate. Okay. okay. Anyway, yes. Um, Karen, when do you expect that, to, that negotiation to start on that contract then? To his point, you said several months. When do you think that might might start working? On we haven't set up the timetable yet, but um, it's not unusual for us to start six months out um, and and get drafts started and going back and forth so that we can have a new agreement in place by the end of the by the time it expires officially at December 31. Okay. There's one question that I had on mm -hmm. on result one right behind that, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. If you don't mind, if I can ask a question, um, the city response. It's I'm kind of a simple person and I kind of read through this thing in the city response and it's kind of convoluted. It's okay. kind of, uh, I'm still trying to read it several times and I still haven't really quite a, figured it out. I don't understand how you can renegotiate a contract and it becomes retro back to the signing of the contract, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. and that, that's the way it sounds. It goes retro back to 2006. How can a contract, if it's just negotiated at, at a certain time, how can it become retro? Because you can't do a damn thing about uh, what happened previously, right? Or am I wrong? I, I think you're correct, and we don't interpret that this is retroactive back to 2006. What we, we would say is the amended language, we had two ways of doing this. Normally, I would just do an amendment saying section one and two are going to be amended. If the parties sign that amendment um, that just lists section one and two, and it's effective on the date that that amendment was signed. But because we were changing so many sections, I had just about as thick of an amendment document as what the original agreement looked like. And so there's another legal way to do that is to amend the agreement and then restate it. So what you do is you put the amended sections into the body of the contract and then you restate the agreement as a whole so it wasn't parties weren't flipping pages. It was just for ease of the reader, really. Hmm. But only the amended sections that where the language changed would be effective as of October of 2010 when this was signed. Okay. And we never intended to change the term, so that's why it still reads the same. Okay. I, I can't wait till we sign a new contract or negotiate <laughs> a new contract. I, I hope, uh, and, and I know dealing with attorneys it's kind of difficult, but I hope the language is a little easier to understand. Okay. <laughs> so note it. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rich, on result five, then, of that $75,000 loan, the original loan was never paid back but was forgiven by the city. And well, recommending the council probably take some well, resolution we, on that. Yeah, I guess what we're saying that that in future, when the, the, if something, if it's a loan that was approved by the council, mm -hmm. then if you're going to, you know, change that, it, it should go through the council. Now, obviously, what's what's sought is sought, what's done is done. We can't, I mean, what's happened has happened, so... Um, I guess what we're saying is, uh, yeah, let's... More of an FYI then for the council. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and this brings up our point. We, we talked to a fiscal committee about having uh, the city council approve at least uh, contracts or agreements that deal with public facilities such as this one. And I think this is a good example of why we think the council should uh, see these kind of agreements. Like, for example, for Washington Pavilion, uh, Global Spectrum's management of the convention center, the, the zoo, um, golf courses um, that they uh, can be brought into the picture and, and that they have an understanding of what's changed from the previous agreement and, and kind of have that discussion up front so mr. chair yes to that point I think it was uh, I was given by the city attorney's office a number of those contracts dealing uh, identifying some of those contracts that we have uh, for those city facilities and I guess that was my discussion with the fiscal committee too is that for sure we need to be more involved in those those contracts. For example, uh, compliance issues continue to come up um, in just about a lot of these, and, and no fault of anybody's. It's just a case of, you know, are we listed as additional insureds where we need to be? All of these different kinds of things. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that, that I think that we need to be a little bit more aware of as we go forward with some of these contracts. Um, I, I would also have uh, a question for 
city finance. Concerning the 990 form, for example, uh, I understand not wanting to give a copy of it to us, but do we, shouldn't we hold something like that with our uh, city finance department as part of that contract? I mean, we've got a significant uh, contract here with, you know, for the zoo, and it is city properties and things like this. Shouldn't we just at least have a copy of that on file? It would seem to me that we should have that available. Good afternoon, Tracy Turback, Finance Director. Yep. Uh, the the response from the city, of course, in the report is that the the preference or our I, I would place a higher reliance on audited financial statements that are certified by an independent CPA firm that has has actually audited the society itself and their financial statements. I to me that in my profession that carries more weight than a an informational return filed with the IRS. So, you know it's. From some perspectives, it may be six of one, half a dozen of the other, but that's the way I would tip the scale. Um, there's certainly nothing wrong with the city having the 990, but I believe a, an audited uh, financial statement uh, certified by a CPA would, would carry a little more weight. Okay, thank you, um, Trish. As a practical matter, I believe I Bailey did prepare the 990. Is it, Dean, is that correct? Yeah. You wanna... Mr. Chair? Oh, hang on one second. Oh. Dean's going to address it. You know, I just, I just say that the 990 is a public document. It's available to anybody. Um, and, and you can get a public disclosure copy that does, does not have uh, the donors all listed. So, okay. Yeah, online, sure. you can get that available. I, I, I found a website where you can register for free and you can get a 990 for any nonprofit in the United States. And, but you have, kind of have to know where to look. You got to do a little searching and find that website and get registered. So. But, but the society would be required to provide it. As yes. Well. If you ask them, they have to provide it. Yeah. I've heard about those sites too. It takes a doctor to get a, no, to dig into them. But <laughs> other than that, um, I'm really interested in this $75,000 loan that was authorized by the by the council and paid back by the city without without you know authorization from the council again to pay it back um, how does that happen i mean how how does that happen tracy I, I can you can you that. maybe tracy can ask a question yeah. answer that question i uh, that I it, looked at that too, and I didn't quite understand that. You know, yeah. we we pass a re resolution for seventy five thousand dollars, right? And then somehow we give another seventy five thousand. The city does to the zoo, but I don't know where that seventy five thousand came from. Was it just a general appropriation? It, well, evidently, it wasn't another resolution on the part of the city. I'm really going to have to shoot from the hip here because this was uh, obviously about five years ago, so long before my time, and and I think even some of the folks that were here. Uh, their memories have faded a little bit as to the, some of the details that, uh, as to how things occurred. Uh, my understanding is that there, there were sufficient appropriations in the city budget uh, at the time the, the 75000 was paid out to the Zoo Society, so that it, it didn't require any additional uh, supplemental appropriations to make that disbursement to the Society. In, in the form of it, then, that gave them the funds needed to repay the loan. So I, I believe that was the the circumstance at that time, but again, that's I'm, I'm talking about something I know don't have any firsthand knowledge of. So, Don, can you answer this? So it sounds like you had a little extra money, or somebody had a little extra money in their in their budget, and um, made the appropriation to the zoo, and they turned around and paid that money back. Yeah, you know, obviously. Uh at that time, it was a whirlwind of activity between the Zoo Society and the city, trying to work out a, a fresh start, a, a new start, and uh, certainly it's, uh, we, we basically paid uh, through our dollars that were available within our budget uh, to the zoo, and then they in turn returned the check, because if you remember, the new uh, management agreement significantly increased uh, to take care of some of the unmet needs that have been out at the zoo for a considerable number of years, mm -hmm. and so uh, to have, I think the feeling was that to have them repay the loan for seventy-five thousand dollars when we're significantly increasing our management fee to the zoo society. Uh, I think on the surface it didn't seem to make a lot of sense to have them repay that and then increase their their uh, dollars that they have available uh, to run the zoo. And so I think it was just another effort uh, to clean the slate and, and get everybody off on a on a fresh start. Well, as you as you know, you know this council has been very very supportive of the zoo. 
as was ev evident in the uh, in the budget hearings sure. last year, and we'll will I'm sure continue to be that way. But you know, this is the kind of thing again that that needs to be um, brought back here more than likely, so that it's more uh, transparent, if you will, to the uh, to the public and, and that kind of thing. So just sure. a heads up. Thank you. Other questions on this audit? And good job, uh, this one, Rich, you and your staff. On Thank this you. One. This seemed like a difficult one. So, if no other questions, I'd entertain a motion to approve this report so the council can see it. Move to approve, Jameson. Second, Aguilar. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda, uh, discussion on request for proposal for external audit services. Rich, yeah, a little background um, on this one, too. The, the current agreement with Ide Bailey to do the external financial statement audit expires this year. Um, uh, there's no provision to extend that. Sometimes when we have an agreement, there will be, you know, you can extend it for another two years. So we got several options here. Um, I, I believe under state law, you don't have to... For professional services, you don't have to, so to speak, bid those. Um, a lot of times the city will uh, for purposes of transparency or for seeing if there's somebody else that wants to do the business. Um, so if, if uh, we have to do something with that. We either have to have a new agreement with Ide Bailey or we have to say, well, we're going to go through the RFP process to see if there's another firm that's interested and then uh, evaluate the proposals and decide which uh, firm will uh, provide the service. Um, in the past, uh, the committee, we've kind of talked about it. Um, there's not a whole lot of CPA firms uh, that can do this audit. Uh, you know, it's kind of a specialized area. Um, obviously, a big four firm could do it. Uh, that would be probably very expensive. Uh, as they'd probably have to come from, I don't know, Omaha or Minneapolis or something. Um, so uh, it's, it's something for we need to decide that probably in the next month or two what we want. If we want to just uh, do a new agreement with Ide Bailey or if we want to do the RFP process or, or what, uh, what, A little what, history what? on this. Ann will remember because her and I were on the committee back then when we were, what, a group of five only. Uh, we had plenty of discussions whether we wanted to take it out for an RFP last time. And some of the factors we considered, one Rich just mentioned is the expertise to do this audit. Uh, we basically at the time concluded McGladry and Ide Bailey were the only audit firms in town, uh, based on our research, that could probably do this, the size of audit and this complexity of an audit. Uh, we also looked at the reasonableness of the fees that we were getting from Ide Bailey and found them to be very reasonable. Uh, so last time, uh, three years ago, we did not put this out for an RFP and uh, did three years with Ide Bailey. So uh, this committee, once again, is going to have to look at them uh, factors and decide uh, do we want to put on our RFP or if we want to stick with Ide Bailey again. Yes. Being new to the committee, um, how many how many terms, if you will, or how many times has I Bailey done this? I, I believe since 1990. <laughs> the, the state did the audit, I think, in the late 80s. They did it for three years in a row. I was in finance. So it's been probably, what, 22 years uh, uh, in various incarnations of, of I Bailey. Yes. So. Is this something rich uh, we could we could wait till the next meeting we for? Could, we, we can think about it and we can wait till our next meeting and okay. yeah. But we need to decide probably by July probably this year. I mean we can't okay. wait till like November and oh we need to get a CPA firm. <laughs> it doesn't okay. work that way. So okay. Yeah. Uh, if everybody's okay with, that, I would just ask everybody on this committee to start giving this some thought. And when we get together our next meeting on May seventeenth, we'll probably need to make a decision at that time which direction we want to go with it. So, Dean, did you want to add anything on that, or? <laughs> well, obviously, obviously, you want to keep it. I, we I would be uh, we'd be more than happy to uh, to continue uh, mm -hmm. uh, working with the city. You know, we believe that we've got the expertise. You know, Dave Steen is very well known in the industry. He is an expert, and uh, and so we're we're blessed to have him. I think uh, to work with the city and. Um, there's other firms I'm sure that can do it too, but uh, we'd be we'd be happy to be of service. Okay, thanks, Dean. Okay, everybody, please give it some thought, and uh, next time we get together, uh, we'll hammer this out. So. 
All right, uh, discussion on process to replace committee members whose terms expire in May. I believe the two committee members whose terms expire are Ann and I, our three-year term, which turned into a six-year term, if maybe even a seven-year term, uh, are about to expire here in May. Uh, so we need to start the process of uh, finding replacements for Ann and I. Um, ultimately, that does kind of fall on the council. Uh, I believe uh, last time when we got Joe on board, um, I knew Joe uh, through previous work experience, so didn't uh, propose him to the council, but, uh, but the council's opinion at the time was they want some input in the process too. So uh, what is the process, Greg, or some of the council people here that we need to do to start getting feedback on some possible candidates from the city council? I could. The first, uh, I think, step is uh, amongst ourselves looking at people we might know. Okay. But as well, I know the, some of the councilors have begun talking about it as well, okay. who do they know that's a CPA? Uh, now, I think uh, if I need to know, maybe or either of you have the opportunity to renew, or are you guys term limited out? I think there's a term limit, okay. Deborah. Isn't that is that correct? I don't know. There is, but I think part of that is because we have three-year terms, mm -hmm. and uh, and so you have a total of, you know. Um, mm -hmm nine years if you have three three year or three three year terms however when we first came on board with the audit committee we they drew straws just to stagger the terms and so that's kind of made it a little awkward as we move forward uh because you know we've reappointed even though they've been served three times they haven't served all nine years so we've had some flexibility there for those who would want to stay on mm -hmm. and that's how we've interpreted that Obviously, moving forward, when we don't have to stagger those terms, we'll just, it'll be the possibility of serving three, three different terms, each term for three years. Yeah. I, obviously, I can't speak for Ann and Greg, but uh, um, I, I am happy to have served for six years. Met some great people. Uh, we've done some great things uh, along with Rich and his staff, but uh, after six years, I'm willing to let somebody else have a shot uh, at sitting at this chair. So. I think, Ann, if, if I remember some off-the-table conversations, you feel kind of the same way. I'm having some sort of a recollection about having drawn the short stick at our first meeting. Yeah, you were That's supposed to be the short-term one. Yeah, I had a, a mm -hmm. one-year followed by a three-year. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that brings me to where I am now, I guess. I've lost track. Well, we uh, on the council absolutely appreciate the service. It's been enjoyable. That you've given, and, and Joe is still in. Uh, even though the pay hasn't quite caught up. <laughs> I'm waiting for that check yet. But yeah, we'll see. Uh, we do appreciate it. We want to make sure you guys know that. Okay, thank uh, you. We do. Mm -hmm. We are just talking amongst ourselves and again, even through this process, uh, trying to make it aware to others that we're looking for okay. experienced people. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's really our, our mechanisms. Uh, okay. I just want to make sure uh, some of the process was in motion that uh, some council people are thinking of names and, and Joe obviously, uh, if you know some people that might want to serve, uh, pass along to a council person. And myself also, yes, I will do that. So, and you too, so, okay. Uh, our terms are done, I believe at the end of May, I believe so, and we do have one more meeting, so, okay. Anything else on that? All right, let's move along to number nine then, uh, Rich. Um, this is something I've attended in the past. Um, it, it's, usually it's held twice a year. Um, they, they, it's by region. Um, this is the closest one for me. And it's federal, state, and local auditors that get together for about a day and a half and talk about audit stuff and get continuing ed. Now, the, the, the problem is I just looked at the website on Thursday last week, and they have decided they're not going to have the May meeting. They're going to push it off till December. Uh, so I will come back to you, the committee, and when it gets closer to December. And okay. I was I was disappointed because the weather is great in May and December. It's it gets pretty cold in Kansas City. So, but anyway, it's uh, okay. So don't really need to deal with that one at this meeting. So. I want to I want to know, Rich, is this like a mathematics friend of mine convention where the first thing you walk in, they give you a problem and you sit down and figure it out before you can register? <laughs> Oh, no, it's not quite that bad. Oh, okay. Usually they just have donuts and bagels, and, oh, and then you sit okay. down, and then they okay. go into it. I thought they'd give you a bookkeeping no. problem or an audit problem No, no, or that'd something. probably be a good idea, though. Yeah, well. But then the next time the attendance would go way down, though. <laughs> so. 
in the past, we've found it very beneficial for Rich and his staff to keep up their continuing education so they can continue to do the good job they want. So, uh, Rich, when you have information on, on this, just come to us again. So. Okay. Okay, we're down to open discussion. Any other items this committee needs to bring up? All right, hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. We don't, don't need I don't adjourn. think we need an executive unless... We just put it on there just in case we need it. Yep. Okay. Second. All right, we got motion to second adjourn. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Both aye. same sign. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rich. Yep. And your staff.